Prisma 2023 Revisited with the future of textile technology. Hello everybody and welcome to episode two of the ITMA 2023 Revisited podcast series brought to you by Textile ETP in collaboration with Simatex. I'm your host Lutz Walter and today I'll be talking to Phil Patterson. Phil is a veteran of the textile dyeing and finishing industry and an incredible source of knowledge and wisdom on anything related to textile chemistry, energy and water management. We'll have a wide ranging conversation on subjects related to innovation, sustainability, energy and water efficiency management, some of the newer technologies that Phil believes or may not believe in, some of the lower hanging fruit in terms of efficiency and carbon and environmental footprint reduction in global textile production. I hope you enjoyed this episode and welcome. Hello, Phil. Great to have you here on our ITMA 2023 revisited podcast. We're recording our second episode here and I'm really glad to have you on the show. We are discussing here in this podcast different textile technologies and today we want to specifically dive deep into the dyeing and finishing technologies and I think we we couldn't have found a better expert than you Phil on this subject. So maybe for our listeners if you can very briefly introduce yourself a little bit your background and the various things that you're doing today as well. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, my, my background is um, a long, long time ago, I got a degree in colour chemistry from the University of Leeds in the UK. Um, I then worked in the industry for about nine years and that was um, working for Courtauld's in research and then I worked in a dye house uh, in Leicester. Uh, I then went back to Courtauld's to work on Tencel uh, and uh, in 1997, I joined Martin Spencer as their dime printing and finishing manager, uh, where I worked for 10 years in a role which was sort of part within the company and part working with the, the supply chain. Uh, and then since 2007, I've been an independent consultant. Uh, and my work is in three main areas. Uh, a third of it is technical support, um, which is sort of helping people with things not fading in the sun, running in the wash, shrinking, bobbling, twisting. Uh, a third of it is restricted substances and a third of it is, is sustainability, which in, in the world of wet processing is using less water, less energy, less chemicals. Um, uh, and aside from working with um, clients in industry and retail clients, I, I also chair two um, uh, councils for ZDHC. So I chair the MRSL Council, which looks at uh, chemical inputs. I chair the Wastewater Council, which looks at the uh, the effluent discharge. Um, and then I'm also involved with the Apparel Impact Institute in their climate solutions portfolio, which is looking at um, uh, reducing the energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions from textile operations. Wow, that's... Uh... That's quite a, a spectrum of activities and experiences. And um, well, I, I, I basically realized that um, you're probably one of the, the best person to talk to when it comes to, to everything related to, let's say, textile chemistry and textile uh, chemical related processing, which is obviously uh, dyeing and printing and finishing, uh, which are essentially sort of chemical processes, usually also referred to as wet processes, which is Quite honestly, not my specialty, and uh, I'm not a chemist uh, by by education, but I'm immensely uh, fascinated by it. And 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 I read your article that you wrote uh, ahead of ITMA uh, for for Ecotextile News, where you went through some of your let's say your expectations for uh, for some of the innovations that uh, that you were expecting, hoping uh, perhaps to see to see at ITMA. And and I. I mean, maybe let's take it from there. So, um, and well, we, we've both been to ITMA and uh, and everybody else who's been there and probably many of our listeners have, uh, it was clear that it was green, sustainable, eco-efficient all over the place. So, um, and well, yes, we all know that there is a, there's a line between um, being, let's say, 
truly, let's say, impactful and and um, and uh, and let's say realistic and 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 so on in in what you do, and then what is referred to as sort of uh, the um, well, the eco marketing or what many refer to nowadays also, also as greenwashing. So when we look at sort of the 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 main um, uh, let's say resources that we use in 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 that processing then we're looking obviously at the chemicals themselves we look at water obviously but we also look at a lot of energy that goes in there so um and maybe if if we if we start with the chemicals so um well there's a general belief to say well less chemicals is better and i don't think that this is a belief that you fully share Maybe if you if you take it from there, how you how do you view chemicals, the role of chemicals, and the state of let's say chemistry, textile chemistry in general? I think with anything to do with sustainability, um, you've got to have a somewhat holistic view, um, and you've got to look at a basket of metrics. Um, so I think less water is good, less energy is good, less chemicals is good. Now chemicals, obviously there's a, there's a broad spectrum of, of chemicals, some are less bad and some are more bad. So you're not just looking at, you know, the, the kilograms that are used, uh, you've got to look at the severity. And, and I've spent the last sort of 25 years working alongside other people at trying to uh, reduce the um, use of harmful chemicals. Uh, in textiles, um, but I think to take a view of all chemicals are bad is, is stupid because uh, certain chemicals are enablers of uh, processes that can reduce, that can use less water and, and energy. So sometimes if you if you didn't have chemicals there, you would need to use higher temperatures or you would need to use uh, more water. So it's a case of responsible use of chemistry um, and getting that balance right so that you are um, using the, the lowest amount of water you can, the lowest amount of energy and the lowest amount of, of chemicals. So it's always those three things together uh, and you can't really consider any in, in isolation. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you might have a situation where um, a, a little bit of something like simple, like a dibath lubricant, it enables a machine to run at low liquor ratio. Now, if you remove that dibath lubricant, you're, you've then got a choice of either using more water, which uses more, more energy, um, or have increased fabric, which is a reject. So <laughs> there, there's certain there's certain times when chemicals can be useful, but that's not to say that you should use um, dangerous chemicals or, or harmful chemicals, but it is this holistic view. Yeah, well, I think that that's very important that many people, I think, would... I mean, to understand that this is these the three aspects, the chemicals, the water and the energy that play together. And what you want to find that is a kind of an optimum between the three and not a an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum of one of the three, because it could effectively have uh, impact on the other two that are worse than what you what you improve on the on, on the one dimension. Um, yeah. All right. Um, well, when it comes to chemistry, well, there's a lot of discussion these days and a lot of obviously marketing as well around biochemistry. And there's some biochemistry in that we use in the textile, have been using in the textile sector for a long time. Certain enzymatic processes have been existent in existence for many years. We also have certain bio-based or use certain bio-based dye stuffs uh, already for, for a number of years. Um, but what's your general uh, sense? Is it our bio-based chemicals really making a significant dent into textile chemistry? What are the areas that you see where they are, if they're not yet fully here, but they're at least expected to, to have a significant impact? Um, well, they are, and as you mentioned, there, there are yeah, enzymes are being used for processes where historically chemicals may have been used. And, and these are embedded in everyday technology. So for example, using amylase enzymes to desize fabrics that have been sized using starch that that's common practice um you 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 see um cellulase enzymes used for 
for biopolishing. Now, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. It, it, it creates lots and lots of cotton dust, which is dangerous for workers. It weakens fabrics. Um, we'd be better off using higher quality yarns rather than using biopolishing. But they, they are there. They're, they're used routinely. Um, we see things like um, peroxidase enzymes used where historically people have used reducing agents to, re to remove um, peroxide after a bleaching process. Um, and yeah, they, they are uh, they're, they're commonplace now. They're, they're good. And, and we're seeing um, pectinases using uh, being used for bleaching in certain instances now. So you can do a bleaching process at 70 degrees with a very low chemical um, sort of load in terms of chemical inputs compared to a typical um, scouring process or bleaching process that's done at, at 98 degrees using lots more chemicals. So, so yes, enzymes particularly are, are there. They 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 do a good job, um, and they are, I think, universally viewed as being better than a typical chemical in in those end uses because they they tend to reduce temperatures and the, and they reduce the amount of chemicals that are used. In terms of new bio based um, uh, products that are there, there, there's quite a few dyes that are being um, developed based on uh, fermentation and and things like that. I would say they are interesting. Um, I don't see them taking over the world tomorrow, um, but but there is there is something there. Uh, I, I think that um, if bio based colorants were to team up with uh, existing dye companies and you can have some hybrids there where you 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 take the 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 fundamental colorant from um, from from a biotech process and then tweak it to make it brighter faster better more uniform more reliable that might be something that is a is of interest in, in the future and of course you've got bio-based feedstocks going into all sorts of, of chemicals now so you have things like bio bioethanol from crops that's something that's been around for a for, for a while and i think there's a debate as to is that a good thing or is that a bad thing but um there's certainly quite a lot of interest in in, in terms of um chemical being derived from crops rather than from from fossil fuels um, but one thing I would say is that currently with the grid systems that we've got around the world and the way that the uh, energy in, uh, is generated in the textile industry, this thing about fossil fashion and getting rid of fossil fuels is yeah, it's, it's sort of laudable. But um, is, is the, you know, does the argument stand up to scrutiny if you've got um, a bio based product that goes into a machine that's heated by coal? ultimately or into by oil you've got to look at the what the wider picture long term I, I think the yeah the the magic if I could wave a magic wand you'd have a lot of bio based um, chemicals and uh, going into machines that are heated by renewable energy but at the moment mo most most energy um, is derived from fossil fuels in in, in the textile industry, and that's what makes a mockery of this this you know people talking about fossil fashion it's all fossil fashion yeah, well, I, I wanted to talk to you about water, but maybe as you as you started the, the energy su uh, subject, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll 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 stick with that one for a moment. Um, because yes, um, well, there is there is a lot of energy, and as you say, there's a lot of fossil energy going into textile processing, and also obviously textile wet processing, um, and some of that is fossil because the electricity that is that you use is generated through uh, in a coal-fired or, or gas-fired power plant. Um, but I think specifically in, in wet processing, we have also a lot of direct fossil energy use, uh, essentially gas, in some cases also diesel, uh, to heat, uh, to, to, to run boilers, to create steam and all these kinds of things. And that is, I think, something where, we, where one could say we should be able to electrify that eventually. Um, but how far do you think we are from that um, in, in terms of uh, perhaps this obviously cost aspect, if it's not cost efficient to do it uh, through electric means, but from a technology aspect, uh, do you believe that we, we will still run gas-fired boilers in 20, 30 years from now in the textile industry? 
I'd hope I'd hope not, but I think we will because um, boilers, like any piece of kit, um, you know, they're, they're they're made to last for a long time. It's, it's like you know, how often do you, if you've got a, a C-rated washing machine at home, are you are you going to replace it with an A-rated washing machine if the C-rated one isn't broken? Um, so there there is economics there, which which. Uh, which says that yeah these things will take a long time to replace but what we've also got to understand is that it's not just a case of electrifying national grids um, at the moment a lot of energy um heat energy in, in the form of steam and electrical energy and, and is is created locally within the facilities by burning fossil fuels now if yeah. you were to electrify um boilers and 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 machinery so that is electrified not only do you need the the national grid to switch, you need the you need the um, the load to increase as well. You you need more to to replace the stuff that's that's generated locally. And I think people don't really understand that. You know the huge amounts of of, of steam and electricity that are generated within facilities. So it's not just a case of let's buy an electric boiler and, and connect it to the mains. You've got to find some way of of actually getting that electricity now for things like sewing factories it's possible to you know, cover the roof in solar panels and, and get a big chunk of that electricity to power a, a sewing factory but for a die house you need a lot of energy now of course th there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there at the moment in terms of um, reducing the energy demand of processes and increasing efficiency and i would say that we could probably you know, just by using best available technology now, reduce the amount of energy and water use probably by about a half. Yeah, you know, there's there's, there's yeah. a lot there's a lot of inefficiency in there. Um, but even then, if if you reduced it by a half, you still got to find that that extra, um, you know, amount of electricity. So, I think national grids have got to transition quickly and they've got to grow quickly in terms of renewables. So. Um, yes, the, the the hope is that the industry is running on renewable energy and and, and largely electrified. Um, but but if I'm honest, I don't think it will be anywhere near 100% um, in 25 years. Yeah, there's an interesting thing you mentioned about the the very the generally slow replacement cycles of technologies in this industry, um, which is I think is a reality. Um, but is it what can we see there? And I, I, I remember you read in, uh, you wrote in your article, uh, the interim article also, about new business models that we may need that may speed up somehow these uh, technology replacement cycles. So obviously, um, a lot of the in innovation we've seen in, I think, textile processing in general have been incremental. So you improve the speed a bit, you increase the energy efficiency or the water efficiency a little bit, but you don't have fundamental breakthroughs, uh, which meets, makes everybody to upgrade immediately because it's just such a no brain. So in many cases, it's incremental. So and 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 often technology that is that is installed and, and a lot of these machines, as you say, they are made to last, they're made to run for for decades. So and and yes, many company owners, company managers say, well, why, why should I throw out something that is still working reasonably well, even if the efficiency is not right, right up to um, up to standard? Um, I mean, some of the things that I don't think we see very much in, in the industry is also um, like uh, business models such as rental and lease of machinery, which to me could be a potential to speed up certain of these innovations, um, probably you would have to see the machine manufacturers uh, taking a more active role. Is that something that you see, something that you hear, um, some discussions you may have had at Edit more elsewhere about that? What's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things, as, as you quite rightly say, machines are generally um, built to last. And, you know, I, I remember when I worked in industry, we'd got German machines and the steel was top quality. And we used to sometimes laugh at people who, who bought cheaper machines um, that only lasted five years. Now, so so before 
the the something corroded or the heat exchanger broke or and he was like well the, these are fooled buying these poor machines but actually the machinery manufacturers have done a really good job in terms of of that as you say that 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 um iterative change um going from winches at 40 to 1 liquor ratio to jets now operating at, at 4 to 1 liquor ratio and even down at 3 to 1 liquor ratio um they've done a great job but if you've got a machine that's at 10 to 1 lick ratio uh, that's, that's working perfectly well and is, is like new even though it's 10 years old, are you going to throw it out? Well, actually, the machines that broke, broke after five years will be replaced by the next best, the, the next model, which was probably better yeah. and more efficient. Yeah. Now, I don't think building rubbish quality machines is, is necessarily the way forward, but I do think on the basis that the technology um, has been developed to, to become better and better, we could find a way of replacing the, the sort of the global fleet of machines um, more quickly. And that would need things possibly like um, sort of uh, leases and rentals and things. But then you look at the, the capacity of the the big machinery manufacturers you know they might have a capacity of a couple of hundred machines or, or up to a thousand machines a year and there's yeah. tens of thousands of machines out there so how, how do we do that how, how do we um you know they, they would need to almost have a, a sort of a, 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 a they need to scale up their their facilities um which might be great for them yeah. uh, but they'd also need to be some sort of take back as well now there, there is a, a second hand machinery market um that, that that operates but but i think it would need to be more organized but i do i do think um the the machinery manufacturers do deserve a lot of praise for for, for the development over the last 30 years to the they, they've done a tremendous job um but it's still a fact that we're always using a lot of last generation machines and the generation before that to to do the production um for the for the industry um so yes the yeah, new new models whatever they are um should be you know we should be able to get them out or we should find ways of getting them out there um more quickly but but i, I don't have any magic answers um to that but yeah le le leasing would be um would, would be interesting um whether things can be developed in i don't know sort of fashion where they can be retrofitted but um they'd almost need to know what the next three steps were um yeah. to, to offer that retrofit type option so, yeah. sometimes it's a new technology that, that that enables them to use less water less energy in the next generation yeah. i I think yes, probably uh, you're right that um, maybe some some aspect of modularity or something could could play a role. Where you know you you may switch out a control or, or something, a control unit or something like that, rather than the whole the whole the whole piece of hardware. Um, the other thing that probably makes the lease or rental model and the resale model also more difficult is, and I think specifically in back processing, is that a lot of machines are sort of custom built or even tweaked by the by the operators in some way so they're not really sort of plug and play and they're they're not sort of uh, thousands of exactly the identical machine that is out there like you you may find it in obviously with sewing machines or cutting tables or or or, or even weaving loops but uh, I think in, in in wet processing it's it's the the number of units and of, of identical nature are probably not as high and uh, so probably the that would be also a, a bottleneck to to any kind of rental retake resale models yeah i mean i think they're mainly built on a um some sort of standard template and there are yeah. options a bit like when you buy a car you know you can get bottom of the range or you can then get lots of gizmos on there so so the basic machines for, tend to be pretty similar but they've got different sizes as you say you, you you've got a, a menu of of things i actually think that as as well as looking at new models for machinery um i i think we've got to look a lot harder at um the utilities in in a factory and that is something that yeah you know, I, I think the the changes in machinery uh whether it's uh, dime machinery uh, 
from a, a batch dying process or continuous. They've made tremendous moves forward, but we're now into a situation where you've got the um, it's harder and harder to to get the the benefits. You've got to put more work in to to get. Uh, you know, so the law of diminishing returns. You, you you are working harder and harder for tiny amounts of improvement, and I think the machines are, are really approaching um, not as good as they'll ever get. But it, it's just a case of um, you you can't halve the water use anymore, or or or, or, or cut something by seventy percent as you may have been able to do from a winch, which was awful. Um, I think we may be looking at a situation where we need to be looking more at water recycling. We need to be looking far more closely at heat recovery and things like that. So within a facility to recycle that water and recycle that heat um, so that actually um, th that could be rolled out. And then if you've got um, a situation where you've got no heat recovery at the moment, which is typical for a dye house, to recovering 80% of that heat or 50% of that heat, and you're recovering 90% of the water, uh, then maybe actually the pressure comes off the replacement of those machines and, and goes elsewhere. So I think I think the, the utilities is an area of, of huge opportunity. Um, and when you look at some of these things, you know, you, you heat up water, and to do a dye in a, let's say, 50 degrees, 60 degrees for cotton, or 130 degrees for polyester, and then you'd, you'd cut, cool that down to 80 degrees before you released it, and then you just you send it out of the drain. Well, yeah. that that's just, it's criminal wastage of energy. It, it, it's awful. It is really, it's really wasteful because you can't see heat, really. Um, it's awful. Now, people talk about these clothes in the Atacama Desert and isn't that wasteful? Well, you can see a big heap of clothes and yeah, it is. It's horrible. Um, but you don't see the amount of heat and energy that is put out of factories into rivers, into effluent treatment plants. It's 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 horrible. So I think th these are things that we probably need to um, look at as well and, and, t and not sort of put the pressure on the machinery builders to get better and better and better. I think it's fine. I think they will anyway. But I, but yeah. I think um, that the utility management is something that we've got to look far more closely at. Right. So from the energy point of view, you believe there's still a lot of low hanging fruit, but it may not be in the in the engineering of the machine, but rather in the operations and or in the pre and post processing um, of the uh, well of, of, of let's say the energy that runs through the system. Let's put it like that. Um, Maybe shifting to water, I mean, it was mentioned already. So, well, most chemical processes need a solvent, and in most cases, the solvent is water, although you can have different solvents too. Solvents too. So, and, and we may discuss that too. Um, uh, but if you, if you look at water, uh, obviously, water always means energy uh, to heat it, to cool it, to, uh, to move it, to dry it. So, um, so from that point of view, probably, the less water you can use from an from a footprint point of view, uh, the better it is. Um, there's a lot of talk about waterless, water-free processing. Uh, what do you think on the waterfront? Uh, looking at sort of recovery, uh, uh, but also processes which use sort of inherently less water. Uh, what are the main trends you you see? Well, as we mentioned, there's been a, a, a general trend to lower liquor ratio machines in batch dyeing, which is a good thing. So going from 40, you know, down to three to one in jet dyeing machinery and, and down to, um, you know, you, you, for things like um, fine polyesters or um, stretch fabrics, you, you may be down at um nine to one liquor ratio in certain different configuration machines the long jet machines whereas previously they, those were at 20 so there's been this downward trend uh, which is good um on the continuous dying front you've got counter flow wash ranges which are becoming the norm whereas previously you would have separate wash baths that were filled and drained and filled and drained and now you've got this um th this this clean um, water coming in at one end of the machine um, and then fabric going in the opposite direction. So it, it's almost 
using the, the water several times within the machine, albeit in a continuous uh, process. That's clever technology and, and that should be very much the norm. Um, th th those things are a, a progress, but it's making things you know, less bad rather than necessarily good. Um, so there's some interesting techniques such as you know, spray dye or using digital printing type techniques, uh, sublimation dyeing. There are some um, low water techniques and if you can use that then that's great but what you tend to find is it, it's for the application of the dye um, so you will see people advertising things as 90% less water um, mm. and actually it's 90% in one bath out of 10. Now, now 9% nine, 9 is good Using nine percent less water is good, but it's not actually ninety percent if it's if it's one bath out of ten. So you've still got to bleach the the fabric. You've still got to prepare it for for applying the dye, and you've still got to wash it off afterwards. So I would always say with these these new developments, yeah, keep people keep innovating, but but let's let's be honest about it. Let let's be let's look at this in the context of a full process. Um, but some of them some of them are interesting. You know, some of the some of the um low liquor um dye application techniques uh you know certainly worthy of uh of, of closer inspection by by the industry you know they they're, they're quite good but the problem is the industry is quite conservative and and you've got machines that are are, are quite flexible so you've got a jet dye machine you can dye anything on it really any any type of fabric yes you need to configure it differently for different things but but essentially the 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 universal dyeing machines, whereas some of these new techniques might only apply to polyester or might only apply to cotton. So you're asking people to buy a specific machine that's not as flexible um, as their existing kit. So that's always a, a bit of a challenge. But yeah, lo lo low water is, is is generally good. Yeah. No. What areas do you see where the water gets completely as the solvent gets completely replaced. I mean, we have there are some examples dying with supercritical CO2 and uh, some other uh, more technical uh, approaches. Do you see that as a as a as a big driver, or do you see that more as a niche also going forward? I think some of these things are are good at highlighting. The fact that typical processes yeah. use a lot of water, so so they're not necessarily the solution. Uh, it's a bit like organic cotton. Organic cotton um, did a, a very good job, or does a good job, of highlighting the issues in conventional cotton agriculture with the use of um, pesticides and chemicals and things. And and now people have, have moved towards things like BCI, which, which uses less chemicals and and um, less pesticides, um, and and that's now high volume. Um, organic cotton still has, has, its, has its place, but but it's probably done a, a better job of, of making conventional cotton better mm -hmm. than, than actually replacing conventional cotton. And I think some things like like CO, supercritical CO2 dying, then you know it will be interesting to see what would happen if these machines were the same price as a normal dyeing machine, um, but they can only dye polyester. And they cost a couple of million dollars. So when you can buy a machine that can dye um, any fibre for a fraction of that price, and um, yeah. you know it's, it's no wonder they they they've not scaled. But it's it, but it's it's not it's not a, a it's a fantastic piece of engineering. Um, but again, it's not waterless because you've got to prepare the fabric before you dye it. So so there's, there's almost always an aqueous scouring. Um, yeah. process beforehand and um, finishing there'll be a finish applied by a pad mangle and softener and water so it's not waterless but it's that that part of it is so um things like supercritical co2 they're just the machines have got to be built like nuclear submarines and they're very very thick steel machines um be, because the pressures are, are absolutely enormous um but if somebody were to um, have a solvent that replaced water that you could, you know, reuse and, and gave you certain benefits, and you could clean it and, and 
and, and keep on using it, then then yeah, fine. That that I, I think with chemicals, you've got to look at the the hazard profile, but you've also got to look at exposure. If you've got a zero exposure um, scenario, yeah. then you can use some chemicals that that um, you know aren't necessarily the best chemicals in the world from from a hazard profile. But if you're not exposing anybody to it, if you're delivering massive environmental benefits in terms of energy and water use, then then yeah, that that's something to 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 look at. Personally, I I like zero liquid discharge, um, and I think in probably not necessarily in my working lifetime or even my lifetime, but I think at some stage we will work to liquid zero liquid discharge um, because is it OK to use a load of chemicals um, to add a load of chemicals and remove a load of chemicals and then put all those chemicals um, into an effluent treatment plant, partially remediate them and put them out into the environment? Probably not. It's, it's probably not OK. You probably think, yeah, it, we've done it for, for you know, 100 years or so, but I think the pollution aspect of it um, will be seen to be unacceptable at some stage in the future, just because just from a principle, it's like, why, why should you as a factory dump stuff in the river for your neighbours? Uh, yeah. You know, even if you've treated it OK, there's still stuff in there. And um, so I think I think that may well happen. But what that will then do is drive water recycling. And now water recycling in zero liquid discharges, it, it requires a lot of energy. So I think that will then push people to use a lot less water. Because when you have forced to recycle the water, you're going to use as little as possible in order to re reduce the cost of recycling it. So I actually think zero liquid discharge was um, at the moment you might say, yeah, yeah, climate change is the biggest issue and you, you're actually suggesting something which is um, a higher energy, higher GHG, um, scenario. As we discussed before, if you've got things running on um, renewable energy at some stage in the future, uh, then you've got people using um, less water, less, less chemicals. I actually think ZLD, zero liquid discharge, could be a driver uh, for, for a lot of positive change. Yeah, and we shouldn't forget that sustainability is not just the global level, there's also the very local level. So I think polluting a river is a much more sort of uh, obvious, I mean, obvious for everybody uh, impact on the environment than let's say the emission of CO2 in the global atmosphere, which is a very sort of diffuse and complex process, whereas um, a, a polluted river, which all of a sudden sees all the, the fish go belly up, is something that is very, I think it's a very, visceral example of of, of uh, environmental pollution and uh, and uh, I agree with you that probably uh, discharging uh, polluted water into a river is not something that uh, should be acceptable anywhere in the world in the future and I think we I've, we've seen examples I think in Europe where companies claim that the quality of the water that they discharge back into the river is actually higher chemically speaking or better chemically speaking than the the water they they abstract from the river up, upstream before they go into the plant. So um, so that's uh, whether that's always true. I think uh, maybe debatable, but there is a lot. I think, and then I I believe that the, the zero discharge logic uh, has a lot uh, has a lot to go for it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the um, I say responsible companies will treat their effluent to meet the local regulations, but there's still stuff there. You know, they're, they're not taking it down to, to zero um, emissions of, of things. Um, and if people discharge untreated effluent, it, it's absolutely appalling. And I think it's one of those things where somehow in, in the world of textiles, we've managed to um, have a situation where people think child labour is, is the worst thing that happens. Now, don't get me wrong, child labour is absolutely awful. Uh, I'm not supporting child labour at all. But putting untreated effluent into a river that affects the, the children in a neighbouring village uh, is far worse. Now, I, I used to say to people, I say to people that I, my kids are adults now, but when my kids were small, I'd rather my kids worked in a garment factory than, than lived in a village where the, they had to drink polluted water and, and bathed in polluted water. And I think one of the things that 
um, as an industry and, and as a as a as a sort of brands, the industry, regulator, etc., need to be much much tougher uh, on pollution. Um, that this there's still a sort of a you know people tolerate it and i just don't understand it it's, it's awful and as people go to developing nations and see see the uh, the the neighbors of polluting factories trying to go about their daily life without fresh water it, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking um another another thing i wanted to talk to you about is well we, we talked about the brands and um and a lot of what the brands or basically what the brands want happens upstream in the manufacturing supply chain in a way so and and one of the trends that we see is obviously that um with faster collection changes uh with an an interest to do more even if it's not true on demand but let's say smaller general smaller uh order sizes um is something that that has an impact on the Especially, I would say on the on the on the wet processing part of the industry, where um, there's a lot about economies of scale. But if your customers, the scale of the order of your customers, the differing orders of your customer goes down and down and down, and and it may be exacerbated in a certain way by these drive to generally reduce fashion consumption. So the total volume may go down, and the 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 lot sizes will go down. So Whereas a lot of what you can do from an from an efficiency from an environmental point of view has to do with economies of scale. If you run, let's say, something through a larger system, you are per unit usually much more energy, water, whatever, efficient. Um, is that a challenge for the uh, for the dyeing and, and 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 printing and finishing industry? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if if I if I went into uh, my local supermarket and tried to buy um 80 percent of a sandwich um I, I would struggle they they sell sandwiches <laughs> and that's what i'm going to buy Where, whereas brands can go to a dye house and say i want um a load of fabric which is 80 percent of one of your machines uh, so the the non-optimal loading of machines uh, probably adds 20 percent to the impacts of, of the industry um, in terms of water and energy use. Um, if if dyers could actually sell full machine loads, then, then we, we would have a massive uh, benefit in terms of, of water use, energy use, chemical use. Um, so I think there's got to be some some conversations there. So and I think it's, it's just starting to happen the 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 certain brands are now starting to take water and energy use really seriously but if i'm advising any of them say look you, you it's good to be pushing them to be more efficient because the facilities have, have got a lot of low-hanging fruit but at some stage you've got to take some responsibility and say actually how can we work with you to help you improve your efficiency so when it gets down to load sizes and things like that it's, it's really important the other thing is samples um Typically in a dye house, five or ten percent of the volume is samples, but that will account for probably ten or twenty percent of the impacts. And and samples are sometimes because a designer wants to see what a t-shirt looks like in purple. Well, just imagine, you know, it's like you've got the purple there, you know what the t-shirt is. Do you really need, you know, do you really need that? So I think brands should be paying for samples. They should never be free and they should pay probably double or triple the amount per meter for those samples to account for the uh, actual impacts of samples because sample departments are horribly inefficient there's not a lot the facilities uh, can do about it but there are things like visualization techniques now you know these are these on screen things companies like very variety have got good systems where you can take a photo of a, of a t-shirt and then recolor it to, to to see what it's like um in almost in real life but the virtual sampling has got to be a way forward and that that could reduce the impacts as well pretty significantly right right and i think there are other areas where where brands completely get that if you can't if you can't fill your container in hong kong or shanghai well 
well, either you, you take the extra cost of air shipping or you don't do it. So, um, so in a way, I mean, you don't ask the shipping company to ship half a container. So um, in a way, and I think it shouldn't be okay to ask your, your die house to run half a die machine. So in a way, so. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, this is something where we, we saw um, a, a development at ITMAR. I think it was Cubatex have got a variable load um, yarn dyeing machine. Um, and, and with with yarn dye machines, you can put some blanks in in there to to, to alter things. With jet dye machines, it's very difficult to to alter the uh, the, the capacity of these things. So, uh, but but I think flexibility of load size with machines that is something that that is is an opportunity for machinery manufacturers to to deliver that for um, for the industry. But ultimately, it would be probably better if if the dyeing industry would say, look. I can offer you the, these load sizes, 500 kilograms, 750 kilograms a, a, a ton, and, and order as many as you want, rather than having to, you know, always be compromising. Right. Well, Phil, it's fascinating talking to you. I think we could go on for another hour or two, but um, I'm not sure uh, our listeners have the patience for that. Um, maybe to, to, to wrap it up. Um, I what I can hear from you is that you say there's a lot of low hanging fruit still in the whole sort of textile wet processing, chemical processing, when it comes to energy, when it comes to water, when it comes to chemical use and so on. But I think you're much more a believer of, of, uh, of going for the, what do you call the common sense approaches um, and not the, the pie in the sky uh, uh, kind of uh, or blue sky technologies. But is there anything that you could see on the horizon of, uh, I don't know, five, 10 years that could really dramatically change things? Anything we haven't talked about, whether it's AI machine learning or any other kinds of technologies uh, that you see on the horizon or changes in the way the industry operates? Um, we, we obviously hear a lot about circular economy at the moment, but there's more noise than than action. There's, there's a lot of, and, and I'm not being critical of people, because a lot of a lot of good people doing a lot of good things, but but not a lot of things are, are coming to scale to to have an impact. So so a very small proportion is is textile textile to textile recycling. Um, looking medium to long term tends tens of years, um, I think we will probably see um, a greater amount of, of recycling and um, along the model of the Prato wool industry where they take in dyed um, wool items, rip them up, re-spin yarns and, and then make, you know, they've got a red room, a green room and a blue room and, and they make new red yarns, new green yarns and they may top them up a little bit. I think there may well be some of, of that becoming more mainstream and, be, and becoming more mainstream for other fibres. Um, dope dye, dope dye polyester, R really there's very little excuse for dyeing polyester. You know, it's 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 a process at 130 degrees. It's not as water and chemically and energy intensive as dyeing cotton, but it's still a process where you should be able to dope dye most polyester now. And things like minimum order quantities, um, there are, uh, the, you know, Poly1 have got a, pr a process where they've got low minimum order quantities. We are spin dye have got, you know, a, 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 um, low minimum order quantities. So dope, dope dye for synthetics and, and man-made cellulosics is, is something which, um, you know, has to, increase you know when you've got a essentially you can make a red polyester yarn why then spend a load of water engine chemicals dyeing a white yarn red so, so i think some of these things will will, will have to happen so there's, there's a few things um like that i think some of these spray low water um techniques are are very interesting um, on the denim side of things, um, there's there's some interesting things like um, cool trans, where they actually print a, a, a mock denim, a, a two sided print, um, and that they will print a, a, a medium or pale denim that looks like a, a denim garment. Now at the moment, I always say about denim is you build a skyscraper to achieve a bungalow. You, you dye a dark blue and then bleach it 
bleach it down. Um, so now denims which are built from white up to uh, to be a, a pale or medium shade. There's things like that which are, you know, slightly step change. They 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 move in the right direction, um, and you know, it, it tends to be step step by step change rather than step change in in terms of, of technology. There's lots of innovation out there at the moment, which is great, um, but there's not a lot of it that I'm massively confident will scale to to sort of compete on the millions of tons levels that we've got with business as usual. I think we've got to look at it from both sides. We've got to make business as usual much less harmful than it is. I think we've got to um, you know, look to bring innovation through, but, but bringing innovation through is very, very difficult. I don't want to be negative about it. It's just, just realistic. I love new things that, that that come through, but if you've got an innovation, somebody can build two machines a year, it's not going to it's not going to make an impact. That that's that's the problem. So it is that balance of of um, the low hanging fruit and the and the innovation. But I do think the the main the main things will come from national grids, better management of utilities, rather than necessarily new new innovations coming through. Well, thank you so much, Phil, for for all this insight and all these um, really well informed opinions that you shared with us here today. Um, where can people go if they want to learn more about what you do? Um, I know you you're writing for Ecotextile News. Are there any other places where you work, and where can people reach out to you? Um, I mean, people can contact me directly. I, I'm I'm more than happy to um, to speak to anybody who wants to email me or or, or phone me. I have got a, I think a rather rusty old website www.colorconnections.com, um, which is is not the best in the world, but but you can get details from there. Um, yes, I work. I, I write for um, Ecotextile News. Um, I'm involved with ZDHC, AII, um, and you know, I've been in the industry for 35 years now, and you know, it's it, it's a grind, and it's you know, we we want to keep on trying to make things better, um, and and you know, it's a conservative industry, um, but it has made progress. You know, from when I joined to what it is now, it, it's it's significantly better and more efficient and 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 less polluting. The one thing that as individuals is difficult to manage is is this is the growth um, and the, and the volumes of, of things. That that's something that we um, that that we need to address. You know, collectively as as an industry. Well, thank you so much, Phil. We'll we'll link to the uh, to your uh, we'll link in the show notes to the uh, to the various uh, organisations and, and 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 websites that you mentioned. And I'm sure we'll talk again uh, very soon, well before next ITMA, and we'll see what wet processing innovations we will see uh, in uh, handovers. It seems in 2027. Well, thank you very much, Phil. Have a lovely Pleasure. day. Thanks very much. Bye bye. <laughs>